Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and I wanted to bring a message to you from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 10. I've entitled this, The Lord's Confirmation of Salvation. When I was young, when I was a teenager, I met a boy in my hometown, a fellow teenage boy, about the same age as me, and we were playing basketball together in a, in a park, a uh, local park in our hometown. And as we played together, we would uh, talk about things. And he mentioned to me that he said, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I believe in Jesus. And I told him, so do I. And, and I had become a Christian maybe a, a couple years prior to that, two or three years prior to that. But he shared with me some of the struggles that he had in being a believer. He really struggled with some doubts and struggled with fears and anxieties and worries about things. And, and so he had a lot of, uh, a lot of, questions about the Bible and questions about the Lord. And so there were times where we met and we didn't play basketball and we uh, talked about the things of the Lord. And I was much younger then, didn't know as much as I do now. But the, um, but I tried to do what I could to help him. And, it, and I'm reminded of that situation where, where there are people who make a profession of faith and, and, and their faith is real, but they doubt it. And they and they have doubts, and they battle with doubts, and 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 they wonder if 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 their salvation is real. Now there are people, many people, who make professions of faith, and their faith is not real, and they're deluded, they're deceiving themselves, which the scriptures uh, discuss in a plethora of passages. But what about those who struggle with their faith? And and I'm and I'm. And I know that it's very important that you do know that you're a Christian. If you truly have believed in Christ, you need to have full assurance of faith. And the Bible speaks about that as well. And our passage today is going to highlight that. And it's going to highlight it in a very interesting way. I was thinking about why would people, true believers, have doubts about their faith and... Some ideas came to mind is that some uh, maybe lack gospel comprehension, full gospel comprehension. They're still not able to understand a lot of the deep truths of Scripture. And when they read the Bible, it doesn't make any sense to them, or at least certain passages. And, and there are more passages that are more difficult to understand than others, but they just battle with with, with doubt in the sense that they, 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 they can't seem to grab a hold of what Scripture teaches. Uh, maybe some even think that even though I've made a profession of faith, I'm still just too wicked to be saved. God can't save me. I'm too wicked to be saved. Maybe they've set under um, the strong preaching, which is a good thing to set under strong biblical preaching, but it, it brings a guilt complex to the point where they feel like they're too wicked to be saved. But it could be too. And this is what our passage is going to address. Maybe they lack assurance because they fail to see God's hands working in the midst of their trials, in the midst of their sufferings, in the midst of the difficulties of life. What causes the doubt is the difficulties of life. What causes the, the, the apprehension is the difficulties of life. Now, it's very important to have true and full assurance of salvation so that you are not deceiving yourselves. Maybe you think you're saved and you're really not. But if, if you doubt, you need to understand what salvation is. You need what to under, make sure you understand what the gospel is. Peter is writing to a group of people that he mentions in chapter 1 of his letter. He calls them the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. This is in a place located in Asia Minor, these areas, these regions, and Asia Minor is modern-day Turkey today. And at the time that Peter's writing this, 
Most likely Paul, the Apostle Paul, is still alive. But Peter is writing to these people because they're, they're suffering. If you read the entire letter of 1 Peter, you would find that they're, that they're suffering. But the type of suffering that they're facing is the suffering of persecution. He's not talking about uh, physical ailments, um, uh, physical sickness, as much as, uh, as being persecuted for their faith. That's why he uses terms like exiles. And you say, why does he use the word dispersion? It's because a good possibility that what happened here with these people is that they lived in Rome, and there was a period of time where where people were cast out of Rome. Jews were cast out of Rome, and and uh, uh, people were cast out of Rome, couldn't live there anymore, and these people migrated to these areas in Asia Minor. But the reality is, is when they got there, they're just as much of an exile there. They're just as much of a foreigner there. But Peter talks about it more in a deeper way, as you would see in the early parts. These people are believers in Christ. They've made a commitment of faith. They're not just exiles physically. They are spiritually exiles. They don't belong in this world. They have a different home. But you can imagine facing persecution because you name the name of Christ and how day after day you're ridiculed, you're, you're shamed, and, and you're put down because of your faith in Christ. It could lead to doubts. It could lead to fears. These people were struggling with persecution. They were like a fish out of water. You don't follow this world. You don't follow the, the mold of this world. And so Peter writes to them. Peter writes this entire letter to encourage them, to strengthen them, to tell them that they have nothing to worry about. If they truly know Christ, if their hearts are knit with Christ and God, if they truly know Him, they have nothing to worry about, nothing at all. They can have a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory, he would say. They can realize that they that the, their soul has been saved. And they can model that and demonstrate what it means to be a believer. And so Peter writes to them, yes, to encourage them, yes, to, to strengthen them, but to, incur, to exhort them to remain faithful to the Lord in all things. Do you have struggles in this world? Yeah, I would assume you do. I have struggles. This world is sinful. It, it's, it's on its way out. <laughs> it's, it's passing away. It's not going to last. It, it, everything's breaking down. God's curse is upon it because of the sinfulness of humanity. We're looking forward to a, a new heaven and a new earth, as Peter would describe to us in 2 Peter 3. But for right now, we are here. At this moment, at this time, living in this sinful world, facing whatever struggle comes, especially because of our faith in Christ. And what these believers need, the ones that Peter writes to, is they need confirmation. They need that confirmation of their salvation. Because they're facing the battles every day. They're facing the struggles every day. There would become a period of time where, where Nero, who was the Caesar in Rome, would really lose it in his head and blame all the Christians for the fires that he set in Rome. And, and as a result of that, Christians would be hunted down, thrown into lion's dens, uh, made sport of. I mean, you name it. 
the Christians were going to be the group that was going to take the blame for what Nero did. And the Christians would be looked, as the, looked on as the outcast. They would be looked on as, as those to be despised, as those to be ridiculed. You follow Jesus as Lord? It's foolishness, right, to the Gentiles? Well, they would, they would, they would magnify that and make those Christians pay for, that, for following that ridiculous belief. It's a danger to our society. And so these Christians need to be encouraged. Do you receive persecution from this world? You stand for Christ. They will cancel you. You stand for the Lord. They will reject you. They may not put you in a physical lion's den, at least yet. But they will find a way to try to make you look bad, to make you feel shamed, to make you feel like you're nothing. And they will take all their hatred and place it upon you. This is what the early church, this is what Peter's readers are dealing with. And Peter writes to them, and we're not going to look at the entire book. We're just looking at verse 4 to 10. It's a, it's a wonderful text to say, listen, let me tell you what it means to be a believer. Let me tell you what it means to, to serve Christ. Let me tell you what it means, the significance of what it means to follow after Jesus and follow his word. Let me read to you chapter 2, verse 4 uh, through 10. Peter writes, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Chapter 2, verse 4 to 10 flows from the very beginning of the book. It's really a logical conclusion, uh, even though it's even though Peter has more to say, starting in verse 11 of chapter 2, moving forward, there's much more he wants to say. It becomes, in a sense, connected, though, verse 4 to 10, to, what, to everything he had said before. If you go back to uh, chapter 1, I mentioned to you the recipients who Peter writes to and where they're located and that they're that he's talking about how he's talking about their spiritual status. He talks about that in verse 2. How they are elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. He's like, "Listen, this is something God has done in your life by saving you, transforming you, changing you." To be associated with God, to be associated with Christ is a great thing, even though it, it makes you a target for this world. And he amplifies that in verse 3 through 12 of chapter 1 by telling them that, you know, praise be to God, blessed be God, 
because he has, because of his great mercy, he has saved you. He's caused you to be born again. Your life has been changed. You have now a, a future inheritance that will never pass away. God, God is even guarding it by his power. And that's what brings rejoicing. Even though you're facing various trials right now, and those trials, God is allowing them. You know what? You know, God is allowing the persecution to take place in your life because it tests the genuineness of your faith. It makes sure it's real. You're not going to be like a Judas and eternally betray the Lord. Even though you haven't seen the Lord, you love Him. And you believe in Him. And you need to understand that this salvation is something that was promised to you from the, from the sense of the Old Testament. From the beginning, this has been God's plan. So you need to understand that, that God has, that in His wisdom and in His grace and in His sovereignty has changed you. He, is, he has transformed you. And that's why. That even in the midst of all these trials, even in the midst of all this persecution, you have to be holy in your conduct. You have to show holiness and righteousness. Display that to this wicked world. You also must display love. Love for each other. Love for the wicked of this world too. And you do that from a pure heart. A heart that has been saved and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And you have to truly understand that you need to be longing for God's Word, just like a baby longs for the milk of his mother or her mother. You need to have that source of encouragement. You need to have God's words implanted in your heart, just like the psalmist would tell us in Psalm 19, 119. So you put away all the malice, all the deceit, all the hypocrisy, the envy, and all the slander. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. That should be gone from your life. That should not characterize who you are. Be like a newborn infant longing for the pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up into salvation, meaning that you become stronger in it. You, this is what brings assurance. But there's one final piece of the puzzle. To have this assurance, you need to understand what it means to be a believer, what the ramifications are. In chapter 2, verse 4 to 10, the passage that we're going to look at, there's no commands here. There's just declarations made by God that Peter mentions. Statements, realities that you must believe in, that you must adhere to. These are truths that you cannot fail to understand. There's three of them. There are three realities, three truths that you must grab a hold of in light of what God is doing in your life. And to really have that confirmation, to know that you are right with God. You have, to, you have to believe these three realities, these three truths. They have to be, these three truths have to make up your worldview. Let's look at each one of these. This gets us into our passage. The first reality is that the Lord honors you with salvation. The Lord honors you with salvation. The way you want to think about this is that 
as we go through this, what you're going to see, this is uh, starting in verse 4, going to the beginning of verse 7. So what you're going to see is that the, the flow of the text is that when when God saved you, that was a thing that He did that honor, that, that brought honor to you. You see, the, 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 the Christians in Peter's day, when Peter's writing, those in Asia Minor, those in these regions, it's like the rest of the Roman world. It was an honor-shame culture. And so the, the Christians were looked on as the, the ones shamed, the ones despised. That's how the world would paint them. And, and what Peter says is that may be how the world paints you, but it's not how God paints you. God gives you honor. He honors you with salvation. You need to understand what the full scope of that means. So let's begin with it. He says, as you come to him. So this is that word him is going back um, to the word Lord back in verse three. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to the Lord. And, and it's, 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 it's like the imagery of walking towards the Lord. It shows the idea of coming to the Lord in faith, approaching the Lord. It's like, here's the world standing around you, and you're saying no to the world, and you're saying yes to God, and you're walking towards Him. You're making a movement towards Him because the Lord is the one who came into this world. Christ, who came into this world, died on a cross, buried and rose again, and He is Lord. And he is the one that can save your soul. So Peter says, as you come to him, as you have, as you have seen him and known him in a salvific way, he's the living stone. He was rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. So you say, how does this all fit? This is kind of how it reads, okay? The main statement is, verse 5, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. That's what God is doing. That's the, in a sense, the expression that encapsulates the honor that God is giving you, that the Lord is giving you, that He is bestowing upon you. But you have to understand it. And so Peter prepares you to understand that concept, that metaphor, by talking about the Christ. You have come to Christ. Verse 4, right? As you come to Him. Who is Christ? He talks about Christ. He defines Him or identifies Him as a living stone. As a living stone. And you go, what is that? It's definitely a metaphor, but where's that coming from and what does that mean? What's the significance of all of that? You know, he talks about having a living hope in chapter 1, verse 3. So he's used this word living before. Here he talks about a living stone. Some would say the contrast is, is that Christ is not like the dead and dumb idols. He's living. There is the passage from Paul in 1 Thessalonians, which talks about that you have talked about the Thessalonian believers who have turned from their idols to the living and true God. But the word for stone here, there's another metaphor going on here. There's something else happening. And, and as we go through the passage, we'll see it more and more because it anticipates uh, some Old Testament quotations that are in verse 6 and verse 7 and verse 8. The kind of stone he's talking about here is what it will be labeled or identified as the cornerstone down below. The cornerstone is the stone that becomes the foundation stone for any kind of building. For a building to be made, it has to have a cornerstone. That's the most basic and most essential part of a building. Once you have that cornerstone in place, 
and you have it in the right place and the right alignment, then every other stone that's built upon it is can be placed around it and on top of it and placed accordingly so that your the foundation of the building is made and then the building is built. That's how these that's how structures were framed. Jesus is that cornerstone. He's that living stone. It's a stone that represents that he is the reality. That he is everything. You have come to the one who is Lord of all. You have come to the one who is chief of all. You have come to the one that, that determines the destiny for all. The eternal destiny for all. He is the living stone that everyone must bow to. But notice what's happened. You've come to him in salvation. You've come to the living stone, but that living stone was rejected by men. You've come to the one that the world rejected. You've come to the one that has rejected God. You see it throughout the Old Testament as God was rejected time after time after time as he sent prophets to them. And then when Christ shows up, the, the Son of God himself, they reject him. They reject him. But it doesn't thwart God's plan. But in the sight of God, he is chosen and precious. He is the one. He is the one that God has chosen and that is precious. You see, the living stone is, the imagery is like this stone is this, the source of all life, the source of your life. He is the one that is that cornerstone that's where everything else is built around and built upon it. And even though men reject it and reject the Lord, God chose him, and he is precious in God's sight. You go back to Isaiah, all the servant songs of Isaiah. It's replete with descriptions of how the coming promised seed, the Messiah, is God's chosen and precious one. Remember, when the dove came down, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. You've come to the living stone. Everybody, everybody's rejected him. The humanity has rejected him, but you have not. You have not. And so what does that lead to? It leads to what Peter's saying in verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. The idea of a spiritual house is, is like a temple. Think of a temple. And, and God's building the temple. But this temple's different. It's not a physical temple, but the imagery, the metaphors being used are the same. There's the, uh, Jesus is the cornerstone, and the temple is built all around him. And we're part of that. We're included in that. We're like living stones. He's the chief cornerstone, but we're, we have life. We're not dead. He saved us from our sins. The, there's all these metaphors and imageries that Peter's using in this passage. And he's trying to, to show in a way, by using these imageries, to, to the people that your life is, you have a living hope. You've been born again. You, you have, now you're like a living stone. You're part of God's building. You're, you are included in what God is doing. You're literally being built up. You yourselves, you are a part of God's family. Just as Christ was chosen and precious, Christ chose you. 
Remember, he mentions that in, explicitly at the, just in verse 2 of chapter 1. And he's placed you with him. You know what the Lord is doing? He's honoring you by saving you. This world rejects him. That's why they hate you. This world rejects Christ. That's why they despise him. And that's why they despise you. Literally, being built up, that's progressive. It's, it's the idea of ongoing. You are, uh, salvation is not just an instantaneous thing, which Paul would describe it as justification. There's also the process of sanctification. When, when Peter and, and, and the New Testament writers talk about salvation, they're not just talking about the moment, the instantaneous moment in life, in time, where you came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And, and, you, and you, through faith and re, through repentance and faith, it's, it goes way beyond that. It becomes it's eternal life. You now have eternal life. Your life is changed. Your life is different. And God has come in and, and has placed you into his body. And through the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, you are now being transformed day by day by day by day to be someone you were never before. And so the Lord, is He honors you. This is not something the world gives you. This is something only God can do. And God chose Christ, and He chose you through Christ. There's a lot of theology wrapped into all of this. The Apostle Paul spells all of that out in detail in the book of Romans. But what God has done is he, brought, he has brought you to Himself. He has drawn you to Himself. He has revealed Himself to you, Peter would say. You have come to Him. And He's honoring you with salvation, placing you in His family. He's creating a people for Himself. And even though this world rejects him and this world would reject uh, you, you're precious in his sight. He continues. He says, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. And, it, it, and notice the next phrase. To be a holy priesthood. To offer sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is interesting. What does that mean? Well, to be a holy priesthood, he's going to talk about later, uh, down in verse 9, a royal priesthood. Here it's a holy priesthood. What does this mean? Think of the temple. Think of the Old Testament and the temple. Well, there was a functionality in that temple. There were people given, placed there to do a certain function. What was that function? It was the Levites, right? And what was their job? What was their task? They were priests. What did priests do? Priests brought the people to God. He said, I want you to understand something. You're like a priest. You know what you are in this sinful world? God has placed you in His family. Literally, it's like you're a part of His temple. His spiritual temple. Spiritual family. And you're His priest. Holy. That means He's transformed you. He's changed you. And you know what you're doing? By who you are in this lost and sinful world. This is why God keeps you here until He takes you home when you physically die or maybe you, you're alive when He returns. But if not, if you, if you die before He returns, your death is your exit from this world and your, and your entrance into heaven. But until that day, 
You're a priest. You're, you're, you're a living testimony of who God is. And, you're, and by giving the gospel, by, 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 by living a life of holiness, loving each other and desiring the pure milk of the word, it, it changes you. You're transformed to be in a testimony of God's grace and mercy in this world and to be a testimony of God's judgment. You are a spokesman for him. You represent him. Just as the Levite priests represented him to the people of Israel. We represent him to this lost and dying world. And we're a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? What are spiritual sacrifices? Well, Hebrews 13, uh, Philemon 4 and 8 talk about it as good deeds. Hebrews 13 verse 15 is worship, praise and thanksgiving. You go to Revelation chapter 7 verse 15. But you know what he's getting at here? You know what offering spiritual sacrifices is? It's you yourself. Paul would talk about this in Romans 15. Romans chapter 15, he says, He says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness. You're filled with all knowledge able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Say, what is he talking about? What, Pete, what is Peter talking about? You see, Christ has transformed you. And Lord, in saving you and honoring you with salvation, not only has he brought you to himself, he's transformed you. He's made you into someone that you would have not ever been apart from him. And that is, you are a living testimony of the Lord and you function like a priest in that you bring people to God and your life becomes a sacrifice on the altar. You are been bought with a price. Your life becomes your ministry. You do that which God has energized you to do. How you live in this world is a sacrifice. You don't care about the things of this world. You don't care about what happens in this world. You care about Christ and what He tells you to do and what He has told you to do and what He's equipped you to do. Sharing Christ with others. Showing the world that this world means nothing. It's offering yourself. Doing everything necessary. Paul lived his life as a sacrifice. He would even tell Timothy that. That it's all coming to an end. He writes that in 2 Timothy. It's, it's I'm going to be poured out like a drink offer. I fought the good fight. Finished the race. This is what is acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You see, the Lord transforms you. 
He directs you towards Himself. He transforms you by Himself. This is how He's honoring you. He's setting you apart from this world. And He gives more reason for it. Verse 6, He begins to quote the Old Testament. He says, For it stands in Scripture. It stands in Scripture. Behold. And He's quoting Isaiah chapter... um, 28 here. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 28, this is what's interesting, is whenever you get an Old Testament quotation in the New Testament, you got to go back and look at it. you got to go back and look at the original uh, place where it showed up. And so in Isaiah chapter 28, Isaiah chapter 28, Judgment on Ephraim in Jerusalem is the title in my ESV Bible, but just notice this. Oh, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and the fading flower of its glorious beauty which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has one who is mighty and strong like a storm of hail, a a destroying tempest, like a storm of, uh, of mighty overflowing waters. He cast down to the earth with his hand. And the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim will be trodden underfoot. And the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley, will be like a first ripe fig before the summer. When someone sees it, he swallows it as soon as it's in his hands. In that day, the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people and a spirit of justice to him who sets in judgment and strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. So judgment's being talked about here. The context here is of judgment. The context is of of judgment coming. He's judging the northern kingdom. That's what is meant by Ephraim. Verse 7, he says, They reel with wine, stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They're so... uh, they're so messed up by strong drink that, that, their, that their vision is not clear. And they say, to whom will he teach knowledge? And to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk? Those taken from the breast? Is he treating us like we're young little kids that know nothing? For it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, he says in verse 10. Line upon line, here a little, there a little. We're tired of this. Well, I want you to know something, God would say. You don't, you want to reject my word? Well, let me say this. Verse 14, you better hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem. You have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we have an agreement. And when the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not come to us. You know what we have, God? We have, we have a, a, um, we've, we've made a contract to escape death. We're going to be okay by ourselves. We don't need you. Our refuge or the lies that we've made. We, uh, in falsehood, we've taken shelter. We don't need your truth. We can do it our way. Well, God says, let me tell you something. You're not going to win. If you reject me, you're not going to win because he says in verse 16, Behold, I am the one who has laid 
who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. And whoever believes will not be in haste. He says in verse 18, your covenant with death will be annulled and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. You will be beaten down by it. You will face your judgment. Peter's quoting that one part of that passage, just verse 16. He's applying it to the Christians, to those that he's writing to, and he's saying, listen, God used that original passage as a confirmation of these, these people who were rejecting him for their judgment. But it also has a positive flavor to it. That cornerstone that's laid in Zion, chosen and precious, speaking of the Messiah, it's, it's, he's already mentioned it, Peter has. He's already introduced it. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That's the idea of never be shaken. You see, it was, the, it was those people as in Isaiah 28 who are being described as rejectors. Just as people rejected Christ when he was here on earth, just as people were rejecting Christ in the time that Peter's writing, just as people reject Christ now. Doesn't matter what time in this human history you live, if you're rejecting the Lord, if you're rejecting God and His Word and His Son Jesus, if you are rejecting, God's judgment is upon you. But those who believe in Him, those who trust in Him, will never be put to shame. Yes, this world may shame you, but the Lord is the one that's going to honor. God will not put you to shame. Remember what Jesus told the, the apostles? Fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. That's God. Fear God. Peter is saying, God, He has saved you. He has drawn you to Himself. He's transformed you by Himself. And you know what He does? He affirms you. For himself. This is all the way in which the Lord honors you with salvation. So the honor is for you who believe. He said at the beginning of verse 7. It's all because God has exalted you. What's implicit early in the passage, the idea of honor is now made explicit here. This is, the, in a sense, the conclusion to this first reality. The honor is for you who believe. If you truly have believed in the Lord, you repented from your sins, turned to Him in faith, He honors you. He exalts you. You're going to be with Him. This life is one day going to be over. This is, this is going to be a, uh, just a speck on, the, on the, the scale of the eternity that awaits you with our Lord. So you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to worry. When the doubts come in, when you, when you because of... The struggles. Maybe, you know, you're ridiculed, you're shamed, uh, uh, you're canceled because of, of, your, of, of your profession of faith in Christ. God's allowing that test. He's allowing this to happen. He's testing the genuineness of your faith. And He'll test it by fire. He wants your faith to be found to result in praise and glory and honor. And the struggle makes it shine through. The struggle makes it shine. So the first reality, the first reality, the Lord 
honors you with salvation. But there's a second reality. This starts in the middle of verse 7, going down through verse 8. It's a shorter part of this. And he's he's talking about something positive, but from a negative perspective. <laughs> uh, notice how this works. Notice how this reads. So the, the, the honor is for you who believe, but look at the second part. What about the unbeliever? But for those who do not believe, so he's flipping it. Now he's talking about the unbeliever. Now, the unbeliever's not going to listen to Peter's words. He, Peter's writing to the believer about the unbeliever. What happens to the unbeliever? You know, the, think of it this way. The world at that time, which is still the world today, it shames the, the Christians and it honors itself. It lifts itself up and shames the Christians. God's going to flip it all around. What happens to the ones who don't believe? And those in the world will never see this coming. This is what they're blinded to. They're blinded to the reality that God is in charge. They're blinded to the reality that God controls everything, that He is the sovereign one in the universe, and that everyone is accountable to Him. They don't think about Hebrews 4.12. They don't think about that God is really the creator who brought everything into existence in six literal 24-hour days because that's the way he chose to do it. They don't think about that. They don't think about that, that God is sovereign. They tell you, they'll tell you that Genesis 1-11 to is a myth. It's a fable. But what happens to those who don't believe? Now he's quoting from Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So this is another passage, but it's still talking about that cornerstone, that same imagery that Peter's been describing since verse 4. In Psalm 118, Psalm 118, that psalm starts with saying, Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. He'll say in verse 8, the psalmist, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princesses. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. <laughs> they surround me, surround me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surround me like bees. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Open to me, verse, eight, verse 19, the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. So the psalmist is praising the Lord for his, for his wonderful deeds and how he has received, verse 15, glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. He's praising God for his salvation, for what God has done. And then he says this in verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected, it's become the cornerstone. This is the Lord doing it as marvelous in our eyes. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. 
And blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. <laughs> you know what Peter's doing? As he took Isaiah, the Isaiah passage, which was in the context of judgment, but applies it to the believers. He takes the passage from 118, from Psalm 118, which is applied to a righteous situation, a good situation, a positive situation, and applies it to the unbeliever. Isn't that interesting? It talks about the surety of God's judgment for the unbeliever. When it says the builders rejected, that means they saw the Lord as unfit for them. Lord, you're not, we're, we, you are unfit for us. You cannot save us. We need to save ourselves. We do not want you in our life. We do not want this man to rule over us, as Jesus would tell in a parable. They believe the lie of Satan in Genesis 3.1 where they think that they know more than God and they have the right to question God, to debate God. Well, they rejected him. He became the cornerstone. For the psalmist, that was the thing. That was what, you know, the, everybody can reject him, but the Lord is mighty. The Lord is mighty to save. The Lord is the one whom the world is accountable to. The idea of cornerstone is he's the chief one. Everything's built around him. And they are choosing to reject. Now, what I want to do is I want to, before we go to verse 8, I want to show you the end of verse 8. The way Peter writes this is he makes two points in regards to uh, what he's going to say here. He's telling us that the Lord... But right. what he's saying in, at the, in the middle of verse 7, going down to the end of verse 8, is the second reality, and that is that the Lord protects you from judgment. The unbeliever is going to receive judgment. That's obvious. But in contrast, the believer is the one that is protected from judgment. But notice how Peter explains this. He talks about, in, in verse 7, how... God, he's showing the sovereignty of God here. By God being the chief one, the cornerstone, it talks about the surety of his judgment upon the unbelievers. And, and notice at the end of verse 8, it talks about how they disobey the word as they were destined to do. It picks up that same idea of sovereignty. We call this a chiastic structure where what Peter would talk about in verse 7, he brings up again at the end of verse 8, and what he talks about in verse 8 at the beginning and near the end is all about a, a second idea. So it's a chiastic structure. You find this throughout Scripture. You see, God is sovereign. They were destined to do this. You say, wait a minute. That brings up another can of worms. Yeah, it does. But what it shows you is the severe to the it shows you the, the surety of God's of, of God's judgment upon them. Just as chapter one, verse two talks about God's sovereign plan in saving a people for himself, God has a sovereign plan to judge every unbeliever. It's their destiny. That God is protecting you from that judgment. Because God is sovereign over your life. Paul would describe this in Romans chapter 9, and it is deep. The book of Job is all about this, and it's deep. You can't go around, you can't escape God's sovereignty. You can't escape it. And every unbeliever thinks that they can live according to their own wishes and their own... They think they're sovereign themselves. And they think they're sovereign over themselves. But it's just not true. Yes, God did not make us robots. 
but God is still sovereign. Their judgment is sure. And then he says in verse 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He's quoting Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14 there. The idea of a stone of stumbling is they, they see the Lord as a nuisance to them. Something that would be um, a stone out in the field. And, and, um, and it's like, you, oh, you just stumble over it. It's a nuisance and you just kick it away. Just, it just unnerves me to have to deal with that. It's, it's, it's imagery of a rock of offense. It causes people to, he causes people to stumble and he causes them to be offended by him. They see the Lord as a nuisance and they see the Lord as an offense to them. It's as though they say, you know what? I don't want to deal with you. I don't want you in my life. I don't want you showing me my sin. I don't want you to preach to me. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear God's word. I don't want to hear your message. Don't tell me I'm a sinner. Don't tell me I'm lost. Don't tell me that I am um, on my way to hell, that you're going to judge me. I don't want to hear that. And what makes them stumble is because they reject the message of salvation. They disobey the word. So the unbeliever, the Lord is protecting you from the judgment that's going to come from the unbel- that's going to come to the unbeliever, that's going to be upon the unbeliever. Number one, their judgment is sure. First part of uh, verse seven or all of verse 7, sorry, and then the end of verse 8, and then the rest of verse 8, not only is it sure, it's going to be severe. But God's protecting you from that. He's protecting you from coming judgment. That's another reality, another truth, because He is sovereign over all things. And see, for the unbeliever, They don't care for God, right? He's a nuisance. He's offensive to them. But to you, He's true. He's everything to you. You know His judgment's real. You know His judgment is just. And you know he is just in sending you to a lost in the, or a, a hot and eternal hell forever, justly. You realize all of that. And you cry out to him to save you. You come to the knowledge of your sin and repent from your sin. He's not a stone of stumbling to you. He's not a rock of offense to you. He is dear to you because you come to Him. You're not put off by Him. You come to Him. You want to have assurance of salvation? Know that the Lord honors you and He protects you. You have to realize that. This has to be part of your worldview Finally, the Lord blesses you with privileges. Not only does does He honor you with salvation, protects you from judgment, He honors you with privileges. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who have called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Let me just go through these pretty quickly. Um, Chosen race. He's just like a list here of of privileges. You're a chosen race. Uh, That's going back to Deuteronomy 7, Isaiah 43. It means you're set apart from this world. You're set apart from its destruction. It means you have a purpose. You have the blessing of purpose. A royal priesthood. Well, this is great. Not only is it holy priesthood, it's royal. There's a, 
there's a kingship here. He's drawing from Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. It means that your destiny has been restored. There's so much to this. But you have a blessing of, of destiny. You have a life that you're going to live out for all eternity. You're a holy nation. You possess the Holy Spirit who changes your life forever and ever. You have the blessing of relationship. And you're a people for His own possession. He's going back to Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 here. Satan has no more claim on you. You're now a resident of heaven. You're his own possession. That means you have the blessing of redemption. And finally, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. That proclamation, that's your sacrifice. That's your act as a holy priesthood. Mentioned back earlier in verse 5. Read Paul's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10, and focus on verse 7. We are a living testimony eternally of God's saving grace. Paul would even mention that again in, some, in other words in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. But you, he's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, and you proclaim that excellency to everyone else. You have the blessing of being a representative, the blessing of representation. You represent the Lord in this present evil world. And what do you say? Well, how do you represent Him? You're telling others that He can transform you just as He transformed me. He took me out of the darkness of this world, placed me into the marvelous light of His Son. And once I was not a people but now I am a part of God's people. Not only can He transform you, you may be His chosen. You can be in His family. I know that He chose me. And once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's the idea of ongoing relationship, ongoing mercy, ongoing grace. We have an eternal identity with Christ. You can go to Hosea chapter 1, verse 6 to 10. God had chose Abraham to display grace to the nation of Israel. We've received the grace and mercy of God. This shows us His compassion. He has forgiven us. So you can, you can be a representative of Him, being a testimony of Him, saying God can transform you, change you, place you into His family, give you His mercy and forgive you of your sin. But don't reject His word. We have no reasons to fear anything in this world, nothing in this world. We can have full assurance of faith. No matter what suffering, persecution we face, no, no matter what pushback we get from this world, we can follow Christ because the Lord has honored us with salvation. He protects us from His judgment. And He blesses us with great and special privileges. You say, what do I do about all this? There's not one command here. There's not an exhortation. But what this does is emphasizes the exhortations that have already been given. You live holy lives. You live lives transformed. Do what, what He says in, in chapter 2, verse 1. One, put away all the malice, all the deceit, all the hypocrisy, the envy, the slander. Put it all away. 
Live for Him. Shine as lights in this world, as Paul would tell the Philippians. Love others. Love each other. Jesus said if they tell you to go one mile, go two. If they hit you on their cheek, turn the, turn the other one. Give them another one to hit. You mean be willing to be abused by this world? Yeah, if it needs be. Even if it needs to be. Show love. Do what you can do. This world is lost and on its way to hell. God has saved you from all of that. To be a light to it. Until He is done. Until it's all said and done. Spend time in God's Word daily. Desiring the pure spiritual milk. Meditate upon His Word. Let it change you day by day, moment by moment, so that your worldview becomes what it needs to be. Living in this sin-darkened world. That's how you have confirmation. Live in hope, live in joy. Live in the life that Jesus has given you. Relish in it. Act differently than this world does. And you'll experience the Lord's confirmation of salvation. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are so thankful for all of your goodness, all your grace, all your mercy. Lord, we're thankful of all the blessings that you give us. Lord, you have saved us, transformed us. And Lord, we live in a sinful world that hates us, but we're to be the shining light to it. Lord, I pray that you will continue to work in and through us to accomplish your will in this world until you say it's done, until the time is over. Lord, may you receive all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.